We test the spirits because God commands us to. Not complicated. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. What? You mean some of them may not be? That's kind of a scary and disturbing thought to a lot of people. I mean, here the Apostle John has been saying in 1 John 4, 1 and following, and in 1 John 2, all through 1 John, we have an anointing from the Holy One, 1 John 2, 20. You have no need of anyone to teach you, 1 John 2, 24. And we know by this that he abides in us by the spirit which he gives us, 1 John 3, 24. And oh, by the way, you better test the spirits to see whether they're from God because you may wind up with one that isn't. Test the spirits is God's command. And you better be alert and beware and be very wary and careful of anyone who tells you you don't need to. John Arnott, who was the head pastor of Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship, in a tape, 12-16-1994, said, quote, Don't even entertain the thought that you might get a counterfeit. We need to have more faith in God's ability to bless than Satan's ability to deceive. Any of you ever hear that? Our God is bigger than your big bad old devil. John Wimber actually said that to me. We, my husband and I were part of the vineyard from the day that John Wimber actually joined up with it when, when the pastor of the vineyard actually came back from South Africa with him. And John opened up the door to do the stuff, the signs, the wonders, and the miracles, which, by the way, I believe are valid for today. I am not a cessationist. I no longer call myself a charismatic, because the term, frankly, and I think tonight and uh, during this past weekend, you've had a glimpse of why, the term freaks me out. I'm a continuationist. I believe the Holy Spirit did not croak, if you will, at the end of the first century. He hasn't been on a 1900-year sabbatical. But you better test the spirits to see whether they're from God. And those commands to test the spirits are given in the context of the exercise of the genuine, right? John Wimber said, oh, we don't need to teach the young prophets how to test the spirits. Our God is big enough to sort it all out. They'll figure it out as we go along. Lou Giglio in a conference that, that Carol Matriciana showed a few years ago at another conference we were doing together, a Calvary Chapel up north in Gold Country, a conference that took place in January 2011, probably in Texas, we think, with Beth Moore, with John Piper, where they were leading the people into a Lectio Divina exercise. And Lou Giglio steps up afterwards and he says, don't you for one split second let anybody put a doubt in your mind that God, that that voice you're hearing in your head is from God. You are worthy of God speaking to you. In other words, what they were saying is your sincerity acts as kind of a magical blanket of protection. But nowhere in the Bible is there a single verse that assures us that our ignorance or our sincerity alone will protect us or guarantee us automatic immunity from demonic deception, not one. I defy you to show me one. On the contrary, John 3, 7, little children, let no one deceive you. 2 John 7, many deceivers have gone out into the world. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 3, in the last days, dangerous times will come. Evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse. Ephesians 6, put on the full armor of God that you may stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And the tragedy in the church today, one of many, is that the, the average Christian wouldn't know a scheme if it ran us over in the street. Is it any wonder that most of us sheep in God's pasture in the average church look more like a steaming plate of lovely lamb chops? because we haven't got a clue what the schemes of the devil look. We're standing firm against the schemes of the devil, and we haven't got a clue what they are. Deception is one of his biggest ones. If you need any greater authority, Matthew 24, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, verse four, see to it no one mislead you. Many false Christs will arise in my name and will mislead many. Verse 11, many false prophets will arise, will mislead many. Verse 23, 24, 25, for false prophets and false Christs will arise showing great signs and wonders and will mislead where it possible and clearly it is or the Holy Spirit wouldn't have wasted so much paper and parchment warning us about not being deceived even the elect. 
the key sign of the end of the age is massive spiritual deception. You've heard it time and time again from virtually every speaker this weekend. Christian occultists with genuine power is what Jesus was talking about. Rick Warren and the preterists notwithstanding, Rick Warren who says to us prophecy is none of our business, and those who believe all a prophecy has been fulfilled as of 70 AD, we must know the times in which we live. Luke 12, 56, how is it you don't discern the time? And it's almost upon us, you've been hearing it all weekend, a one world government, a one world ruler, a one world religion of panentheistic unity and peace, bound together by an ecumenical universalist into spiritual philosophy that doesn't see division between anybody, and all glued together with experience, mysticism, altered state of consciousness. As, as Ray Youngen pointed out with Karl Rainer, the, the Roman Catholic mystic, where he says the Christian of the future will be a mystic, someone who has experienced something or he will be nothing at all. And all, of course, in the name of tolerance, the political correctness of our day, we offer our service, ourselves, our lives to the God we know by so many names. God, don't you know, it doesn't care whether you call him he, she, it, Allah, Om, uh, what, take your pick, Gaia, he doesn't care. Jim Wallace of Sojourners, a hardcore socialist. Some have dared to venture the term communist in reference to him. He's the spiritual advisor to President Obama. Actually said that it's time to put aside dogmas. All these narrow-minded Bible thumping fundamentalists with their doctrines, how very annoying. We need to put all that aside and have a one world unity. How many of you noticed any religion is hunky-dory, super terrific, unless you're a Bible-believing Christian. Alice Bailey, who was also mentioned by, by Ray, the occult prophetess who coined the term New Age, informed by her spirit guides that the New Age illumination would come through the Christian church, not around it. She instructed her followers to leave the outer shell of Christianity intact for the time being and change it from the inside. You don't need to eliminate all these Christians, don't you know? They'll be all up in arms about that. You infiltrate, you get yourself voted in, you get yourself ordained as pastor or pastorette, and you change the theology, bringing in Sophia, Mother Goddess, a, a, a kinder, gentler Jesus, without all this blood dripping from the cross or hell, as Brian McLaren said. It's the worst advertising God ever had. Who needs that? Second, no kidding. Purple iPod, uh, Purple Podcast uh, in uh, 2005 in an interview with Leif Hansen. Hell is the worst advertising God ever had. What kind of God is going to decree eternal separation from himself in hell for a finite amount of sin? Oh, I wish we had the time to talk about what some of these people are teaching you. Very persuasive, reasonable, inclusive, loving, and totally ignoring the fact that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Again, let me tell you, 1 Timothy 4.1, the Holy Spirit explicitly says that in latter times we're in them. Some, he meant many, shall fall away from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines taught by demons. God's word commands us to test the spirits. Thessal, 1 Thessal, 2 Thessalonians chapter 5, 19 through 21. Despise not prophetic utterances, quench not the spirit. Amen? But test all things carefully, hold fast to that which is good, which by implication means you do something radical with that which isn't. How do you test the spirits? Well, you've got the occult version. Even the occultists will tell you important to test the spirits. Yes, it is. Let me give you one test that the occultist, Silva Mind Control, which I was involved with, as you know from my testimony last night. In many ways, says Silva Mind Control, it doesn't matter what the source of good, uplifting information is, as long as it's valid. How do you know if a spirit or something communicating to you is good? Well, if it's valid, if it feels good, then you know it has to be important and good and valid. They won't say from God because that's not quite where they are with that. The information, energy, wisdom, or guidance is either good, meaning it works, or it's not meaning it doesn't work. This must be the final test of any channel or any channeled being and of all channeled information. So how do you know if a being that comes and says, he said, Manito Cuauhtémoc, or Jesus? I attended numerous 
uh, sessions with Pachita, the medium with whom I worked in Mexico City, the shaman psychic surgeon, in which Jesus himself came and gave us teachings. The Jesus in my psychic laboratory who gave me much wisdom and many teach. How do you know? Oh, well, it's valid enough. It makes you feel good. Tired of the program? Change your channel. Isn't that a cute thing? You don't like what the channel, the medium is saying to you? Well, just show, trade it in for another one. Channeled material is a value only if it returns you to the grandeur of self. Look, the occultists and the, the heretics may have their own version of how you test the spirits. The scriptures give us their tests, and that's what I want us to look at. It's going to be a Reader's Digest version condensed like that. These are not the only tests, but from scripture, I believe they're the most important ones. The first test, and make a note of it, and I hope you have your Bibles on hand. If you don't have time to turn all the passages, write them down and look at them later, okay? Because we're going to be going like Speedy Gonzalez. Arriba, arriba, epale, epale, andale, andale. And we're going to move right through these, because otherwise I'm going to run out of time. And this time the pastor will yank the lectern out from under me, and that will be disconcerting. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Open it with me. This one you do need to look at. It's important that you see this. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 13. Enter through that narrow-minded, Bible-thumping, fundamentalist, evangelical, dogmatic, and may I add, politically incorrect gate. What? You got a different translation? For the gate is wide and the way is broad, open-minded, inclusive, universalist, interspiritual, that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Oh, all this Jesus stuff? My goodness, how narrow-minded and bigoted can you get? How narrow-minded, you need to be more open-minded. Some of us are so open-minded, all our brains fell out. The scriptures don't give us that option. You've got a problem with narrow-minded, Bible-thumping Christians? Take it up with scripture. Because Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Do you think for one split second, if there were another way to come to the Father, that Jesus would have been stupid enough to think he had to incarnate and leave the fellowship with the Trinity among themselves and come down to earth and go through everything he went through to die on a cross for this? If there had been any other way, what is the theology? And let me tell you now, let's continue in Matthew chapter 7. Few are those who find it. Verse 15, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. The, the sheep's clothing, they pretend to be shepherds, teachers, overseers of the flock. Those were the ones who dressed in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, people, by what they're teaching you, by what they believe, by what they're disseminating, they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by the fruits. And I will promise you, every occultist, every New Ager, every apostate, every heretic knows this passage. And then he gives you a little lesson in spiritual life agriculture. Grapes aren't gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles. Good fruit doesn't come from bad trees. Bad trees don't produce good fruit. Therefore, you'll know them by their fruits. And I will tell you how many of you, I know I sure have, have heard people like Kenneth Copeland with the late Paul Crouch sitting there on the set of TBN. Well, this Dave Hunt, how dare he come across against God's anointed? Does he fly a Learjet? I do. Does he have a huge bank account? I do. Does he have books that sell in the mega billions? I do. The arrogance of these men who believe that good fruit means fame and even genuine spiritual power. William Branham, the patron saint, if you will, of New Apostolic Reformation, has had genuine psychic power. That man was the real thing as far as spiritual ability. The question is, what was it coming from? Was that good fruit? So then you will know them by their fruits. Now, let's read the rest of the passage because let me tell you something. There are several kinds of fruit here and I'm going to put it in context. Verse 21. You know that old time TV guy or was he a radio guy? And now for the rest of the story. What was his name? How, what was his name? Palmer. 
the rest of the... So then you will know them by their fruits. Well, look at all the cool stuff and all the people who come. And I've got a church with 10,000 people just on the other side of, of town. Obviously, that's good fruit and God's blessing. I mean, you little podunk piddly people with your tiny... Obviously, that can't be good fruit. Really? Really? Is that the measure that the Lord puts on it? I don't think so. Be careful of viewing things from the human perspective. So then you will know them by their fruits. Verse 20 of Matthew 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, but Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them the most horrendous the most heart-wrenching, the most devastating words to be uttered in the universe. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Now let's put this together with the fruits. There are two kinds of fruits. You've got the fruit of life. You remember the, the, the Galatians 5, the deeds of the flesh? False prophets are often characterized by adultery and falsehood. Jeremiah 23. And make note of these passages. We do not have time to look at them, but you need to examine these on your own. The characteristics of a false prophet, 2 Peter chapter 2, 1 through 3, verse 14, verse 19, greed, lust, arrogance, deceit. They don't keep God's commands, 1 John 2, 4. They profess to know God, but by their deeds deny him. They've crept in ungodly and unnoticed, Jude 4 and Titus 1, 16. I will tell you that sets of Christian television is littered with the shipwrecked lives of false prophets, false apostles, false teachers, and false evangelists who stand up and preach the word while they're having an affair with the secretary and then dump the wife of 15, 20 years and along with who knows how many babies because, oh, God led them, really? False prophets frequently are seen by the quality of their lives, but not always. Some false prophets and some of the most dangerous ones live exemplary lives. Pachita, the woman with whom I worked, would have put most Christians to open shame. I never saw this woman turn away anybody, even when she was old and sick and exhausted beyond words, selling her little trinkets on the street because she wouldn't collect money. Some of her followers did, but she wouldn't. People like, like Mother Teresa, who's going to falter on the surface looking at her life? Horrendous theology, helping the Buddhist die a good Buddhist, helping the Muslim die a good Muslim, and thinking that if her nuns simply went like that with, with cool water on their forehead and said some magic words, that would be enough to get them into heaven, or at least purgatory. But on the surface, these false teachers, these false prophets lived exemplary lives. Mark Galley, are you guys familiar with Mark Galley? He's the, the editor of uh, Christianity Today and uh, was the editor of Christian History Magazine. He said in a recent article that came out uh, in 2013, Incredible Journeys, What to Make of Visits of Heaven, as he was examining these disparate stories of people who supposedly have these near-death experiences and come back saying, well, I met God, his name is Om. Well, I went to heaven as an evangelical and you've got this holding place like the Mormons have where you get to decide whether you're going to be in... And he said, you know what? They may be a little confused about their theology, but they're coming back with lives filled with service and with good works and with kind deeds. And then he says, and I quote, if the devil is inspiring such godly work, he's confused about his job description. No, he's not! What part of, watch out, Satan comes disguised as an angel of light. So why are you surprised that his servants come disguised as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their deeds? 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, 14, 15. These great theologians who stand up and pontificate on stupidities. He's not confused. What's the most important fruit? It's not the fruit of life. That can vary depending. It's the fruit of doctrine. How do I know? Verse 20, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, which means it's kind of important to know what the will is, right? I don't care what you're experiencing, what are you teaching, what is your doctrine. 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 5, if anyone advocates a different doctrine that doesn't agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine conforming to godliness, he's conceited and understands nothing. He who knows God listens to us. 
He who is not from God does not listen to us, 1 John 3, 8. What is the teacher, healer, prophet at all teaching about the fundamentals of the faith, about the Bible, about God, about Jesus Christ, about the virgin birth, the resurrection, the exclusivity of Jesus, or are there many paths to God? About the Trinity, T.D. Jakes is a modalist. He believes, like William Branham did, that the Trinity is a doctrine out of the pit of hell. See Peter Wagner? One of the great founding, guiding lights of the new apostolic reformation thinks that the Trinity is a non-essential. Excuse me? What? Hell, Rob Bell and Brian McLaren, you already know that. But Rick Warren, when you're talking about what are the fundamentals of the faith, he said, hey, today there aren't really many that fundamentalists left. I don't know if you know it or not, there's such a minority. There aren't that many fundamentalists left in America. And then he, he tells you he knows what the word fundamentalist means. He says, now the word fundamentalist actually comes from a document in the 1920s called the Five Fundamentals of the Faith. It's a legalistic, narrow view of Christianity. Oh, really? I wonder which of the fundamentals he would think we need to get rid of because it's such a legalistic, narrow view. Maybe the first fundamental of liter literal inerrancy of the autographs, the original edition of the scriptures that were, that were inspired and God breathed by the Holy Spirit. Is that one of the fundamentals we can do what? without? What about the virgin birth and the deity of Christ? What about the substitutionary view of the atonement, that he died on the cross to take the penalty for your sin and mine upon himself, so that as we believe in him, you may come into the presence of the Father, covered in his righteousness and not yours. What about the bodily resurrection of Christ? Is that a fundamental that we can just as well do without? What about the imminent return of Christ? What fundamentals does he think we can dispense with? I will tell you, it is a frightening thing to see the big teachers of Christianity bring in doctrines of demons that people buy. Ironside, Dr. Harry Ironside said, look, error is like leaven, of which we read a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, Galatians 5, 9. Truth mixed with error is equivalent to all error, except it's more innocent looking and therefore more dangerous. God hates such a mixture. And I wish we had time to talk about the word and about poor Paul instructing even poorer Timothy not to teach, to, uh, teach uh, certain men not to teach strange doctrines. And I will tell you, as you know, that is dangerous work today. Liable to get yourself labeled a hater, a Pharisee, a divider of truth, and already Romans chapter 16 was mentioned. Those of us who are pointing these things out are not the ones who are the dividers of the brethren. According to Romans 16, verse 17 and 18, Paul said, now I urge you, brethren, keep an eye on those who cause dissension and hindrances contrary to the teachings you've learned and stay away from them. These are the ones who by smooth and flattery speech deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Let's come back now to Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, the doctrine, what do you believe about Jesus? That is the essential point. What are these men teaching you about Jesus Christ of Nazareth? John 6, 28, make a note of it. Lord, what must we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. In other words, Jesus himself is saying, what you believe about me is the most important work that you can do for God is an advocate. This is, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Not that you do a whole bunch of other things, right? Because many will say to me in that day, but Lord, Lord, in your name we cast out demons. In your name we prophesied. In your name we healed and did many miracles. And Jesus said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Was he advocating a gospel of works? You didn't do enough stuff? But Lord, Lord, these people thought they had relationship with Jesus. Clearly, they had relationship with the wrong Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, 4, and 5. But I'm afraid for you, little children, lest as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your mind should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we've not preached, or a different spirit, which you've not received, or a different gospel, 
get dodo birds very beautifully editorial edition there but that's basically what he's saying there is a counterfeit jesus there is a counterfeit holy spirit that produces genuine signs and wonders and miracles according to jesus matthew 24 verse 23 24 and 25 matthew chapter 7 right but lord in your name we prophesied cast out demons did many miracles i never knew you the most important thing is what are they teaching you about Jesus? First John chapter 4, verse 2 through 3. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the Spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and is now already in the world. Now, as an occultist, I would have said to you, well, uh, duh. I'm cool on this one. I believe Jesus Christ came in the flesh, by which I meant I, what, I could have gone up to him, I could have pinched him, he'd have said, ouch. Of course he came in the flesh. What are you talking about? This verse was addressed and written to the pre-Gnostics, a group of, of heretics that were already rising up. Many of the epistles were written to refute the early heresies that were starting in the church. And he's saying, hey, you've got some people coming into the church that's saying matter is bad, matter is evil, like the Hindus, right? Matter is not good. Jesus Christ couldn't be God in human flesh because flesh is evil. He had to be separate. Jesus was the Christ spirit over here that came upon him during the baptism and left before the crucifixion. And he has not, Jesus Christ has not come as God incarnate in human flesh. And the Holy Spirit was saying through John, think again. Run. There's just one name that can keep you out of hell, and it's the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus.